Well, good morning. morning. Welcome to the Ransom Church. My name is Cody Toops, and I am the South Campus Pastor, and I get the privilege of preaching this morning. But before we get started, I have a message for South Campus. I miss you guys. It's so weird not being there worshiping with you, but I can't wait to share the Word of God today. And so as we dive in, I want to remind you that we're in a series called InstaFam, and it's in this series we've been talking about what does it look like to be a family? What are the uniquenesses inside of that and the relationships that exist and that it takes intentionality on our part as well as it doesn't change in an instant. And so that's what we're doing today. And so in week one, we talked about what is family. And then the second week, we talked about how to resolve conflict. Then we talked about we need to fight for our family, not with them. And then last week, you heard Pastor Phil as he preached and talked about removing family idols. And so today, I get to talk about a very basic principle, a a boots-on-the-ground type message on parenting or how to raise kids without raising your blood pressure. And so that's what I want to do today. And I couldn't think of a better place to start than looking at social media, because after all, it's called InstaFam. And so I found some quotes about parenting, and I want to see if you guys can relate to these, or maybe one of you actually wrote them. And so here we go. Here's the first one. Before becoming a parent, I didn't know I could ruin someone's life by asking them to put on pants. Oh, is that so true? Uh, What about this? I want my children to be independent, headstrong people, just not while I'm raising them. (laughs) Welcome to the Toops house. Um, As kids, we wondered why our parents are always in a bad mood. Now we're like, oh. (laughs) My parenting style has evolved into, but did you die? Some days, my kids can do no wrong. Other days, I understand why some animals eat their young. (laughs) And 85% of parenting is asking, why is this wet? And let me tell you, that's so true in my house. We have three boys, my wife and I do, and we're asking all the time on so many different levels, "Uh, boys, why is this wet? And so, I don't know about you guys, but as we read these and we laugh, it may seem like some parents had some high blood pressure. And so my goal is today that we will be equipped to navigate these relationships, we'll be equipped to parent, we'll be equipped to invest in the people that God has given us the privilege of investing into without having our blood pressure raised. And so there are three basic things that I wanna dive into and talk about today, and so the first one is this. It's the idea that more is caught than taught. More is caught than taught. You see, when I was a youth pastor doing youth ministry, this is a phrase I would use all of the time with our youth leaders. I would use it with our parents. And you actually heard Pastor Phil talk about this in week one, and it's so incredibly important because children, teens, you see, that they're intuitive. They're smart. They pick up on things, and they can tell when you're being real with them, and they can tell when you're being fake. And the reality is they're gonna learn more by watching you than they ever will from listening to you. And I'm not sure how many of you in here have opened the Bible and you want to dive in and you want this parenting advice. You know what I'm talking about, the the do's and don'ts of parenting so I don't mess up my child type things that you're looking for. And as you dig through, you might be surprised to find there's not a lot that the Bible has to say about parenting directly. In fact, most of what it says talks about us and our relationship with Jesus and it's about our spiritual growth and our own maturity. Well, why is that? Could it be that God knows that parents are going to create children in their own image, just like he did when he created mankind, because parents are gonna pass on their values, their beliefs, their habits to their kids. And most of the time, it happens without us even knowing. Much like this, check out this video. So what if God could get parents, could get adults to seek after him with all of their heart, with all of their soul, and with all of their mind? What if God can get the adults to live holy lives? You see, here's the deal. I don't know any parents that would teach their children something that doesn't uh, align with their values, with their beliefs, that doesn't align with their behaviors. They wouldn't do that. And it would be crazy for us to expect less from our children, but it would be even more crazy for us to expect more from them than what we ourselves are currently willing to do. 
And so today, I want to dive in. I want to look at Deuteronomy chapter 6 together. That's on page 112 in the Warehouse Bible. And so if you didn't bring a Bible and you would like one, if you raise your hand, the ushers would bring them forward. If you don't own a Bible, please raise your hand and keep this one. It's on us. We want you to have the Word of God in your life. Now, I want to pay attention to something very closely here. This is the third time in five weeks that this passage has come up. And so it must be important. There's probably a theme. There's something that God wants us to grab from this passage. And so let's pay close attention as we dive into Deuteronomy chapter 6. We're going to look at verses 1 through 6. It's page 112 in the Warehouse Bible. These are the commands, decrees, and regulations that the Lord your God commanded me to teach. You must obey them in the land you are about to enter and occupy. And you and your children and grandchildren must fear the Lord your God as long as you live. If you obey all of his decrees and commands, you will enjoy a long life. Listen closely, Israel, and be careful to obey. Then all will go well with you, and you will have many children in the land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, and you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Let me give us some context of what's happened leading up to this point that we're reading here in Deuteronomy. You see, up to this point, the Israelites have been led out of captivity. They've been led out of captivity in Egypt, and they've crossed over the Red Sea where the people that were chasing their enemies were destroyed. Up to this point, God has given them 10 basic rules or the 10 commandments, ways to live a holy life, and essentially God is saying this. This is the Cody version, but he's saying, look, Here's what's required if you're going to succeed in the new land. This is what I need you to do for me. This is what things should look like, and this is what I need you to establish for this people. You see, and then he says this, learn my commands. Learn my decrees. Learn about me. And by the way, as you're learning, commit yourself to these things wholeheartedly. You see, friends, if you want to be great parents, if you want to raise godly children or grandchildren or nieces or nephews, if you want to have kingdom influence on the people that God has entrusted with you, then you first must learn about God yourself. You must first get to know God personally. I mean, after all, how are you going to raise children to know the difference between right and wrong? How are you going to inform your grandchildren about what's most important in life How are you going to teach your nieces or your nephews about the majesty and the wonder and the honest of God if you yourself don't know it? For as long as I can remember, since I was this big, I've been a huge Denver Broncos fan. And right now, one of my my favorite Broncos players is Von Miller, and you'll see a picture of him up here on the screen. I could go on and on and on about Von Miller. I could tell you that he's number 58, that he plays outside linebacker for the Denver Broncos. I can tell you in the 2011 draft, he was the second overall pick. I could tell you in his very first play from scrimmage as a pro football player, he forced a fumble against the Oakland Raiders, right? And I could go on and on and on about Von Miller. And it may sound like it to you that I know Von Miller, but the reality is I don't. I only know of him. You see, I couldn't tell you what makes him laugh. I couldn't tell you what makes him cry. I can't tell you what he's passionate about. I would assume football and other things, but I don't know. I couldn't walk up to him on the street and introduce you to him personally because the reality is I only know of him. But it makes me wonder, how many people here today merely know of God, but you don't know God? You see, you don't know his love. You don't know what makes his heart break, what makes him cry, what makes him smile. You don't know what it's like to sit in his presence and experience forgiveness and mercy and the peace that he offers because you merely know of God, but you don't know God. John Maxwell is an author, and he's written many books, and and in one book called The 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership, he talks about these leadership principles, and one of the things that he talks about is called the law of the lid, and it essentially says this. It says that you cannot take people further than you've gone yourself, or in essence, you can't lead someone where you haven't been, and you see, 
We have a responsibility as believers to invest into kids, to invest in the children, into teens, into our coworkers, our neighbors, our family. We have this responsibility. But the reality is I'm either gonna be the lift in their life or I'm going to be the lid in their life. And whether you like leadership or not, that's how it is. And we have a responsibility as parents, as grandparents, as teachers, as coworkers, as roommates, to invest, to point people in the way that they should go. And so we have a question, will you be the lid in that person's life or will you be the lift in their life? Because after all, more is caught than taught. Second, we need to understand this, that my child is a gift from God, not an inconvenience. My child is a gift from God, not an inconvenience. Let's take a look at this together. This is Psalm 127, verse three, and it says this. Children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from him. So do you believe that? Do you truly believe that they're a reward? Because I bet if I came up to you today and I asked you, you'd say, oh yes, Pastor Cody, of course my child's a reward. Things are lovely, things are awesome. But let me ask again, do you think they're a gift when you're in the midst, you're in the throes of craziness? Would you say that they're a gift? Because I don't know about you guys, but when the craziness ensues at my house, I forget about this. Sometimes I forget that my children are a gift from God because my house looks more like this. Check out this clip. Can you relate? It's a, bedtime is like a hostage negotiation in reverse, right? Oh my goodness, I am so glad we're through that phase, but it's like that. And not only do you deal with the craziness, but you deal with the constant needs. You know, the diapers that need to be changed and the meals that need to be made and the traveling to and from events and the sickness and the homework. And then there's that question, that question that gets asked 10,000 times a day. Why? Oh, it drives me batty. And so in the midst of all of that, sometimes I forget that they're a blessing, that they're a gift. But the reality is, is children are a gift. They're a gift that requires constant attention, but a gift nonetheless. Now hear me. I am not saying if you don't have kids, then God is withholding his blessing. No, 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 no. I'm not saying that at all. God gives many good gifts in many different ways. But what I am saying is that children are to be looked upon as a gift and as a blessing, not as an inconvenience. But I think there's another part to the gift of children that we don't think about, that we maybe not, don't even realize, and it is this. God believes in you. God believes in you because you see, he's asking you to raise up this child, to teach this child, to equip this child, to know Jesus and to follow him and to teach others to do the same. Oh, what a huge responsibility, huge responsibility that is. How in the world do I do this then knowing that that weight is upon me? Well, first, we need to understand that we are not in control, that we don't have all the answers. And I must let my desire for Jesus, my passion for Jesus, keep me focused on this gift because after all, more is caught than taught. But I think we can also learn from Paul. In Ephesians chapter two, he writes a little bit about this. And so look at this, Ephesians chapter two, verse 10. Here's what Paul, Paul says. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. You see, our children, they're a masterpiece. They're not some knockoff painting that you bought at the dis discount store, brought it home, put it on your wall, got tired of it after a year, and sold it in a rummage sale for 50 cents. No, 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 no. They are a one-of-a-kind, limited edition masterpiece by the creator of this universe himself. But not only is that child, not only is your neighbor, your friend, or whoever you're investing into a masterpiece, but so are you. You have been wonderfully and fearfully made by God to do the things that he made for you, that he planned for you. And so one of which is to raise your child, to invest into that employee, to invest into that niece or that nephew, or to engage with that roommate or that neighbor. You see, whoever it is, God chose you to be able to invest into them in this season. And you are exactly what they need. So do you view them as a burden or as a gift? 
And the third thing I want us to, to wrestle with today is this idea. I need to understand the difference between punishment and discipline. I need to understand the difference between punishment and discipline. In Proverbs chapter 22, it says this, direct your children unto the right path, and when they are older, they will not leave it. Now, let's talk for a second, because this is a proverb. This isn't a promise. And so what this verse is not saying is, Hey, if you bring your kid to church every Sunday, if you're here 57 weeks out of the, or 47 weeks out of the year, then everything's going to be perfect and everything's going to be great and they will always follow Jesus. It's not saying that. It's not saying if you teach them the difference between right and wrong, they will always choose to do right. What it is doing is it's providing wisdom. It's providing instructions that point to Jesus and holy living, which brings glory and honor to Christ. And so as we look at this passage, it starts out, it says direct. Other translations use the word instruct. Either way, it's a verb. It means that it requires action on our part. And so we have the responsibility as parents to teach our children the things of God, to point them towards holy living while shepherding their heart and bringing them along in Jesus. We also have the responsibility to create the framework for their reality, to put in boundaries and fences for them so they know where they can stay, where they can play, and what they need to do to live a holy life. It is not our job as parents to put the leash on them and keep them at arm's length their entire life. No, 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 no. We need to release them because we've given them the boundaries for holy living. This is going to require intentionality on our part, but here's the deal, friends. God has not asked us to raise good kids. He has asked us to raise Christ followers. But I think too often we fully believe if I just have enough faith, if I just have enough obedience, then I will be able to lift my family out of their brokenness. That's simply not true. It is only Christ who can change a heart. It's only Christ who can save a person. We cannot save our children. What in the world do I do with that then? If I can't save my child, what do I do? Well, let's go back to Proverbs 22. I need to point them in the right direction, right? And so in order to do this, I think we need to understand a couple things. We need to understand the difference between punishment and discipline. And so this could be an entire sermon. I'm going to just skim over the surface of these things, but I want to do a side-by-side comparison. And in your handout, you will find a, a box where you can start filling stuff in, as well as you will see it up on the screens as we go through. And so when I'm looking at punishment, I'm looking at discipline, I can see that the purpose is different between the two. When it comes to punishment, the purpose is to penalize or to inflict a penalty for what has been done. Right? You did this, therefore you deserve or you get that. But when we talk about discipline, the purpose behind it is to mature. It says, I want to correct you. I want to train you. I want you to understand how to do this better next time. And when looking at these two, the focus is different behind them as well. The focus on punishment, my experience has been that it's on the past, right? It's things like, you always do this. Why haven't you learned? How many times do I have to tell you? And then we issue the punishment. But with discipline, it's on the future. It says, when you encounter this again, I want you to make a holy choice that's honoring to God. I want you to live in a holy way so you cannot do the same thing. It's focusing on the future. The attitude that drives both of them is vastly different as well. My experience in doing it wrong for many years has been the attitude is anger or embarrassment. It's anger because, man, I've had a long day and I've come home, I've asked the kids not to do that and it's 27 times I've asked and now I've got to get up off the couch, I was watching Netflix and I got to go take care of it. Or I'm angry because they didn't listen. Or I'm angry for whatever reason. And that anger fuels the way I respond and the punishment then that ensues. Or it's embarrassment. How many of you guys, you guys know what I'm talking about. It's that colossal meltdown that never happens except when you're at the grocery store. And it's this utter meltdown in front of everyone. And you feel like everyone has stopped. They're turned, they're looking at you, and you don't know what to do. And you are so embarrassed. It's in those moments that the punishment takes over because those emotions control us. But with discipline, the attitude is one of love. It says, I love you. I want the best for you. 
Therefore, things cannot continue to go on this way. And the result, because I've done it wrong and I'm learning to do it right, the results are vastly different as well, friends. The result of punishment leads to fear and guilt. You see, it's fear because our kids are walking on eggshells through the house. They're fearful of what's going to happen if they make a mistake or they're wondering, is dad just this ticking time bomb? And so they, they live life in fear. And then it leads to guilt because they're kids. They're going to make mistakes. And so when they do, then they feel guilty because of what they've done, and that guilt then leads to fear, and the fear leads to guilt, and it's this revolving door that they can't get away from. But when it comes to discipline, the result is it produces security in their life, and it develops wisdom in them. Security and wisdom. You see, because people feel secure when they know the boundaries. They know the parameters that are there. And so if we're pointing them in the way they should go, and if we're disciplining them to keep them within the boundaries, then that provides security in their life. And it also provides wisdom. Because we're focused on the future, because we're pointing them to holy living, it provides wisdom. Because wisdom is nothing more than learning how to apply God's word in my everyday life. And so they're learning how to do that because you are disciplining. And by the way, Discipline is a sign of God's love. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 12 together, verse six. It says this, for the Lord disciplines those he loves. Psalm 94 verse 12 says, joyful are those you discipline, Lord, those you teach with your instructions. In Psalm 119, 67, my life, I can, I can relate to this. I love this passage. It says, I used to wander off until... You discipline me, but now I closely follow your word. You see, friends, the punishment that we rightfully deserve has been taken by Christ on the cross, and he now disciplines his children to bring about change. He disciplines his children to turn them from rebellion to obedience and to help them see this life from his point of view. In other words, God uses discipline as a growth tool to mold and to shape and to transform us so that we look more like Jesus each and every day. So it only makes sense that we should do the same with those we are investing into, our friends and our neighbors and our kids and all of these people. We should help mold and shape and transform them to look more like Jesus each and every day through the use of discipline. Over 12 years of being a parent, I've done a lot of things wrong. I've done a couple things okay. And I've learned something about disciplining. And these are just three practical steps, three ways to apply discipline in your home. Number one is to do it calmly. Do it calmly. You see, don't do it when you're releasing your embarrassment or your anger or your fear. Because in the long run, if you allow the emotions to drive what you're doing, it's only going to hurt you in the long run. The second thing is to do it quickly. Do it quickly. Please don't delay. Don't play that game. Wait until your mother gets home. Wait until your father gets home. You need to address the issue when it happens, when you're able to do so without allowing your emotions to drive and control what's happening in that situation. And lastly, do it sparingly. You need to do it sparingly. You see, we need to choose our battles wisely. And if we don't discipline all of the time, when it calls for it and we need to discipline, it's going to bring more weight. It's going to be more impactful in the life of the person when we do. You see, my middle son, his name is Jackson. And a couple months ago, Jackson was in our kitchen and he had a, a glass cup. And he's kind of dinking around in there. And, and you know, as parents, you can just see it. It's like you see the future. You know what's going to happen. And, and I was like, Jackson, you need to just stop. You're going to drop that glass. Either set it down or stop doing what you're doing. And Oh, Dad, it's okay. And he keeps bebopping around. And next thing I know, I hear this crash. He had dropped the glass on the tile floor and it went everywhere. And now inside, I can feel the anxiousness coming on. And so I take a deep breath and I'm about to discipline him. Maybe I make sure my emotions don't get the best of me. And my wife, who's so much more wise than I could ever dream of, steps in. And she says, look, Jackson, look at what you can do with a broom and a dustpan. It's not a big deal. And you know what? My wife was right. It wasn't a big deal. You see, we must discipline sparingly. So friends, 
If you're going to invest into a person that God has entrusted you with, it's that roommate, it's that employee, it's that neighbor, it's that friend, whoever it is, if you're gonna raise kids without raising your blood pressure, then you need to make sure that you are first modeling what you expect, that you view them as a gift, and that you learn the difference between discipline and punishment. Because here's the deal. God has entrusted you with these people. And what you are doing has kingdom value. And it is a, literally a heaven or hell issue that you get to invest into them and point them to Jesus Christ. And so let's make sure that we do this well. And I want to encourage us as a church. Don't leave here today just, oh, there is another sermon and go home. Think about it. Chew on it. Wrestle with God over it and say, God, which area of these do I need to work on? Which area do you want to grow and mold and shape me? And then here at the Ransom, we do life groups together. I want you to find someone that's in your life group. Or if you're not in a life group, find a trusted friend and call them up and say, hey, I've been wrestling with this. God is calling me to get better at this. I want to ask you to hold me accountable to doing these things. Why? Because God believes in you. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, I thank you. Lord, I thank you that that when my life was a mess, when I didn't have my act together, you sent your son to die for me. And while that's an amazing decision for me to accept you as my Lord and Savior, and it's the most amazing thing I'll ever do, Lord, it's it's the beginning, it's not the end. And and you have so much that you want to do with my friends in this room, and you want to do with me, God. You want to mold and shape and transform us to look more like you each and every day, and you want us to invest into others. And so, God, would you give us wisdom? Would you give us discernment on how to do this? Jesus, would you point out the area that we need to grow? Please be gentle, but point it out, God. And help us to be more like you, God, because you've entrusted us to partner with what you and the Holy Spirit and your son Jesus are doing to bring about kingdom change. And so, God, may we as the church be kingdom changers here on earth right now in 2017. It's in your name we pray. Amen.